Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today we are talking about introducing you to physical computing and not only that, helping you know how to introduce physical computing to young people that you're working with in your dojo. My name is Nula and welcome to today's call. So as we get started, I'd love to hear where you are joining us from today. Uh, my colleague Ross will be managing the chat. So if you keep those comments in, let us know where you're joining from and ask any questions throughout the call, Ross will be responding to them throughout. So to introduce um, you to our guests here today, my name is Nula. I'm the Global Engagement Manager with the Coder Dojo Foundation. And as part of my role, I help connect volunteers with each other and share learnings uh, across the community. So it's great to have you on today's call and I host uh, a lot of different calls like this, um, but it's great to have you here. And I'd also love to introduce you to my two colleagues on the call. So Vasu, would you like to introduce yourself first? Yeah, uh, hi everyone. My name is Vasu. I am the club's program coordinator for the Raspberry Pi Foundation and for Kodododojo Foundation in India. Uh, anything to do with India, building community, connecting people, uh, getting more people interested in digital making, um, and just doing things with the computer and doing things with their hands is something that I'm interested in and, and something that I do for the foundation here in India. So. Uh, great to be here, really excited to be here. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces as well. Uh, so welcome and thank you so much for taking out time uh, to attend this workshop. And then to Mark. Yeah, great. Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Mark, you're muted. Yeah. That's a good start. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark. I'm a senior learning manager at the Raspberry Pi Foundation, looking after informal learning content. So we, uh, my team creates all the resources for the project site for co-clubs and coder dojos um, around the world. Um, I, and I write and manage the creation of that content. Amazing. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. So we have lots of people already on the call. I can see we have seven joining from India. We have Masami from Japan. We have Myron from the US. Welcome. Uh, we have uh, Jonathan from Perth, Australia. Richard from the Netherlands. Uh, we have John from Hampshire in the UK. Really a, a big spread of people. Manos from Greece. Um, Grace from Western Australia. Um, hello from Italy. Hello, uh, <laughs> uh, John. You you might have to leave early. That is okay. Don't worry. Nadia, great to have you here from Iraq. Uh, we have uh, Tias from India as well. Welcome to the call. Great. So just to give you a quick outline of what we'll be discussing on today's workshop, we're going to be chatting about what physical computing is. We're going to explain it a little bit. Then we're going to go through um, some people's experiences of physical computing. So how people have used physical computing already. Be sure to let us know in the chat. Then Mark is going to bring us through uh, a Pico demonstration. We're also going to do some use some emulators. So even if you don't have the hardware yourself, there's still some things you can do with physical computing to try it out in the browser or um, on a computer to get, get a feel for physical computing before you uh, invest. And we're gonna show you how you can use that as part of the AstroPi Mission Zero. We're gonna also break out into groups and have a discussion so you can share with other volunteers around the world. And all those of you who are joining today can learn from different people's experiences of using physical computing and what they've been doing in their dojo so far. Um, and then we'll all come back together as a group and answer any questions that you have. Great. So what is physical computing? So I was thinking about um, how I would describe physical computing to someone who had never used 
um, or never done physical computing before, never really got into coding or programming. And I found this was a great definition. So it's creating or using devices that interact with real world objects by programming them from a computer. And one of the things I love about this is the idea that it's creative and how it interacts with the real world. So you can see in this photo here, this is one of the photos from uh, a Pi Academy that I attended. And it really shows that physical computing, it isn't all um, hardware and it isn't all very complicated technology. It can be using tinfoil, it can be using motors and wheels and bits of Lego, and then programming that with uh, some device, um, such as we're going to talk through the Pico, but you can also use Raspberry Pis or uh, other computers as well. So um, I thought that was just a really nice way to think about it and thinking about you can create um, and use things around your house as well to make devices. I've seen some people using cardboard to make buggies and different things like that. So definitely a lot of potential. Great. So I am going to hand over to Mark now to tell you a little bit about the Raspberry Pi Pico. Okay, so <clears throat> the Pico is a sort of a, a, a new device that came out this um, year uh, for the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and it's the it's the first time we've uh, created a device that uses what we call our own silicon. So it's a chip that we designed and, and we've had manufactured, um, as opposed to normally like on a normal Raspberry Pi, we use Broadcom chips. Um, this is actually a chip that uh, we've developed, uh, the Raspberry Pi trading have developed themselves. And that means that we're able to sell it at close to cost. So um, it's a very low entry device for um, physical computing at about $4. Um, we price everything in dollars because um, because that's where we, you know, that's how we buy our components in dollars. So it's, it's $4, but from various resellers, the price will vary. Um, it, unlike the Raspberry Pi, it's not a computer. It's a microcontroller. Um, but it can be programmed from any other computer. So you can program it from a Windows PC, a Linux PC, a Mac, um, or a Chromebook. There's extensions for the Chromebook as well. It runs MicroPython, which is a variant of the Python language, a trimmed down version of the Python language. So it should be familiar to any of your learners that have um, got experience using Python. One of the lovely things about the um, Pico is unlike the Raspberry Pi, it has analog pins for reading sensors. Um, so if you've ever used a Raspberry Pi to read sensor data, you need an analog to digital converter to, to, to use it or timing capacitors to use, um, use those devices. Um, but with the Raspberry Pi Pico, there's four analog pins that you can use to read sensors. And as, as soon as we sent it off to a lot of our resellers um they began to make um they began to make their own um, hats for it so there's several hats that you can now buy it for the um pico so there's little displays and little buttons and things like that that you can buy but what i'm going to show you today is just how to how to use it with some very cheap basic electronics so i'm just going to try and share my screen Um, and I can't see what you can see. So is that clear to everyone? Yep. Yeah, we can okay, see. Okay, so over on the left hand side here, I've got the Pico as you buy it. This is just the, if you just ordered the basic Pico, you'd get one of these. Um, it's got a little, a um, micro USB port on the front. It's got what's called a boot cell button, which you use to um, connect to your computer. Um, it's not much use as it is at the moment. What you're going to need to do is if you buy one like this, you need to solder on some header pins. OK, so um, these header pins fit in um, into the underside and then you just um, you solder them on. OK, so I've got one here that I've pre-soldered. Um, once these header pins are on, then you can start actually um, using the device to do some physical computing. So this is one. You can buy them pre-soldered as well. So from the resellers, you can buy them with already the pins soldered in if your soldering is not your thing. Um, and you won't pay too much more for one with the pre-soldered um, pins on it. And what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to use some mail-to-mail um, -mail jumper leads. I'm going to use an LED. I'm going to use a buzzer. I'm going to use a light-dependent resistor and a resistor 
to just show you some of the things that you can do with the Pico. So all these components, again, exceptionally cheap. Um, if you buy them from a website like AliExpress and shipping is a big problem at the moment, but if you buy them from a website like AliExpress, you can get like a couple of hundred um, LEDs for um, under $10. Same with the LDR, same with the buzzers, same with the jump leads. So these are all really, really, really cheap components. Okay, so I've um, taken my Pico and I've pushed it into a breadboard and it's designed so it'll fit neatly across the ravine on a breadboard. Okay, and what I've done is I've plugged in a few components. I'm going to start off just showing you the um, how to control an LED with um, a bit of micro Python. Over on the right hand side of my screen, I've got this editor called Fonny. Um, again, cross platform. Um, so it'll, it'll run on Mac, Linux, and PC. And it's a really nice editor. And we worked with the developer of this open source software to um, integrate the Pico into it. So down on the bottom right here, I've got this option of um, which interpreter I'm using. So I can just use the basic interpreter. So this is like. This is um, just running on Python on my PC. Um, or I can switch over and I can use the Pico interpreter. So now I'm going to run code on the actual Pico. OK, and here I can go print. So I can write exactly the same code as I would normally. And it will just this is now running in micro Python. Um, so Thonny is a really nice editor. We've worked with the developer to make sure it's really kid friendly with just really simple buttons, the minimum you need to, to get programming basically and, and no exceptionally complex debuggers or options or anything like that. So I'm just gonna get this LED to work. Um, so because I'm using um, uh, um, the MicroPython that comes bundled with Thonny, I've got access to um, a module called Machine. That's basically the word for the Pico. And I'm just going to import um, pin so I can access, I can start accessing those uh, pins on the Pico. Um, I'm going to import um, sleep function from uTime. So that uTime is micro time. That's the same, basically the same library as time is on, on, a, on a normal Python interpreter. And then I'm just going to say that I've got an LED and my LED is sitting on pin 16, which is this far out pin right here where that yellow jump lead is plugged into. So I tend to use pins that are easy to remember. So that one right on the far right is pin 16 there. So I'm going to use pin 16 and I'm just going to tell it that it's a pin so I want to control it and then I can um, I can then start controlling that pin so I can say led dot on sleep for one LED dot off sleep for one again I can run that my LED should just blink on and off so You see that? The screen share went off, Mark. Did it? Yeah. And I, since I'm like, I'm also coding with you, I'm trying to learn uh, live as you're doing this. Is there a, is there, Mark, so when I was coding it, my instinct was when I was typing pin, the capital P was not autom automatically there. Is there a reason or... Will that be a problem if I put normal, like not capital P? Open? Yeah, if you don't use capital P, then it won't work. So in Python, the standard is for class names to begin with a capital. So because oh. this is a class and I've imported pin like that, it, it's a capital P. So when I want to say, when I want to use pin, it's always a capital. Whereas the variable I created, LED, I can make it whatever I want. And the, the, the standard when I'm creating objects or variables is to use all lowercase in Python. Right. So it's really simple. I'm just going to put this all into a while true loop. And then when I run it, oh, every time I hit run, it stops my screen share. It's because the run button is right next to the stop share button on Zoom. <laughs> so I keep accidentally hitting stop share. So let me just run that. 
and I should have a blinking LED. And obviously I can change my times. So if I want um, a much faster blink, I can go for 0 0.1 seconds. And there we go. So that's really mm. simple blinking in LED. Um, I've also got a buzzer connected up here. So I've put in a buzzer, but it's not connected to any pin at the moment. But the code for using an LED and the code for using a buzzer is exactly the same. Um, I would just change that LED variable there. I've just changed its, its name to buzzer, but I can show you that if I change where the... I get that annoying sound. So using buzzers and LEDs is exactly the same. Now, as I mentioned, on the Pico, we have um, these analog pins. So what I've done is I've set up an LDR here. So that's a light dependent resistor. So that's, it, it, it will change its resistance current flow depending on how much light it's receiving. So when it's receiving, uh, let me get this the right way around. When it's receiving a lot of light, its resistance is low. And when it's not receiving light, its resistance is high. And I've connected that to a resistor and then connected it to one of these analog pins here. Okay, so it's a very simple circuit and all these circuits are all available on the project site for you to have a look at. But what I'm going to do is I'm now going to write a piece of code so that my LED brightness is affected by my, um, my resistor there. So um, I've prepared this in advance because otherwise I'm going to end up talking for absolutely ages. Um, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from my machine, I'm going to import um, ADC, that stands for analog to digital converter. I'm going to involve, import my pin as well, and then PWM, which is pulse width modulation. And what that's going to do is that's going to flash my LED at very high frequencies. Okay, so the actual frequency it's going to flash at is a thousand times per second is what I'm aiming for. Um, that's my LED frequency. So I've set up my LDR, I've set my LDR is on pin 26. My LED is still on pin 16, but this time, instead of just saying it's an output pin, I've said it's a PWM pin, okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just jot in a little bit of code here and say like, forever, so while true, read the light level, so read the light of the LDR, okay? And um, then set the LED's duty cycle, so the frequency with it, with it, uh, that it flashes to um, this number minus what the light levels are. So let's just stop my existing code. Let's very carefully hit the run button and not stop share. Okay, so at the moment my LED is quite dim. If I switch off my desk light, my LED will brighten up. And then if I put my finger over it, over the LDR to block out the light, you should see that it brightens even more. So as I come in and start blocking out the light, my LED's brightness increases. So that's an example of using the analog pins, okay? Now this is all quite tricky. It's all quite fiddly little stuff. So I, I, I don't often recommend like doing physical computing with very young children because it can be very fiddly for them to work with breadboards. They're much better off using hats and stuff like that. But you can buy LED matrices that sit on the top of um, the sit on the top of the Pico to, to use them. And again, they're fairly cheap. Um, but what I love about physical computing is I've made myself what I've made myself here is a nightlight. Yeah. So I've made a nightlight that I could use um, with a kid so that as the room gets darker, the LED brightens up. Um, and then as, you know, sun rises in the morning and light streams in through the window, the LED darkens and I've got a nice power efficient nightlight um, that I could use in a, in a child's bedroom or the basic concept. The other one I've done with this is a drawer alarm. So you can have it set so that you can hear the tone change. You can have it set so that when the when light hits the LDR, all of a sudden the buzzer goes off. And when it's in darkness, the buzzer stays off. Stays, uh, so when it's in light, the buzzer comes on. And when it's in darkness, the buzzer goes off. So you can have a nice little drawer alarm. You can put it in your drawer and, and close the drawer. And then whenever anyone opens the drawer and light hits the LDR, all of a sudden the alarm goes off. And, um, you know, someone's been having access to your your um, your chest of drawers in your bedroom or whatever. So that's just a, an example of some of the projects you can do. You can do with the Pico. OK, um, is that about time, Nula? 
sorry. Yes, yeah. Oh, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to stop my share for now. Great. We'll just check quickly if people had any questions. I seen someone was asking, Mark, can uh, can you use ordinary Python and do you have to use Tawny or could you, is it because of uh, the Pico that you have to use MicroPython? So you have to use MicroPython or you can code in C if that's your preferred language. I saw some somebody, I, I saw earlier, somebody um, has made a, a Rust interpreter for the Pico. So there's plenty of languages out there you can code in. I, I mean, personally at the foundation, we tend to um, recommend Python because it's it's just much more human readable language and we find um, kids get on with it easier. Um, you don't have to use Thonny. You can write in any interpreter you want. Uh, so you can write in, you could write in Notepad if you wanted. Um, what you would then do is you would call your program main.py um, and then your when you hold down the boot cell button, it connects as a, like an attached storage device. You can drag the program straight over onto um, the Pico and whatever's in main.py runs as soon as the as soon as the Pico's powered up. Um, so yeah, you, you you don't have to use Thony at all, but um, it's just handy because it, it it just connects with the Pico instantly. Um, there is a um, web IDE available for Chrome OS and just in Chrome that you can use as well. I, I forget the name of it, but um, if you search for, you know, using the Pico with um, Chrome OS, um, I'm sure I'm sure you'll find it. Um, um, yes, um, somebody's commented that the Arduino also. Yeah, the Pico is basically very, very similar to the Arduino, and I'm, I'm, you know, the Arduino has the has the nice little advantage of having a lovely like um, <laughs> a lovely IDE that comes with it, and um, obviously a very large community behind the Arduino. So there's loads of learning resources. But yeah, so the and a, a large variety of microcontrollers, um, different types of microcontrollers. So the Arduino is also yeah absolutely brilliant way to introduce physical computing to kids. You know, you tend to write in a variant of C with the Arduino, um, which can be a little bit trickier. But um, but yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant device. Mm. And uh, there's also another question in from uh, Greenfield Dojo. They were asking, what is the advantages of using a Pico versus uh, a regular Raspberry Pi? So what's so the, the kind of difference there? The main, the main advantage is, is that when you, <laughs> that, or, or disadvantage, depends on which way you look at it. I mean, I like using the Raspberry Pi for physical computing, but I have the setup to do that because I'm at home I, and I can just, I can do what I like with my monitors, keyboard and mice. So, um, with the Raspberry Pi, you obviously need to have an operating system put onto an SD card because it's a it is a computer on it in its own. You need to attach a keyboard and mouse to it um, and a monitor to it, and then you can start programming on the Raspberry Pi, which is great. If I was in a um, if I was in a situation like I was uh, teaching a class in a library or a school or um, some company's you know IT suite, they might be less keen on me attaching a bunch of Raspberry Pis to their, their network. They might be less keen on me unplugging all their keyboards and mice and monitors to plug them into the Raspberry Pi. Um, with the Pico, all I need is to make sure that I have some software installed to allow me to write code and a micro USB cable um, that I can then um, plug into the Pico and I can just start coding and doing physical computing on the Pico there and then. Um, so it, it has advantages and it has disadvantages depending on your on a situation you know if i was in a if i was running a workshop and it's you know i'm taking on the keyboards and mice and the monitors and stuff like that i would probably chances are i would probably rather use a raspberry pi um pico is also low low lower power so you can run it on battery for a lot longer gotcha, yeah and i definitely think like it offers it's it's really great i think for dojos because a, like you were saying, you don't need to be plugging in keyboards and mice and screens. Like if a dojo is only running once a week in a venue and they have to set this all up in advance, it has the option that you can just plug it straight into a laptop and start working immediately. And also someone else mentioned this, that the Picos, it's more affordable because even compared to the Raspberry Pi, but also compared to Arduino, like it's, it's just, it's a very affordable way to introduce physical computing yeah. uh, the numbers this u16 returns a value between zero and six five five four five 
um, I, I think U16 is to do with 16 bits um, of, um, of data that comes through. So it will return a number be between zero and 65545. So if I just put in light here, rather than that number, it would do the opposite effect. It would, the LED would get brighter as it as it got as the LDR got more light. So by putting in that, because I know that the maximum this is going to be is 65545, I can subtract from it and um and, and alter and alter the LED's brightness that way. Um, but you'll find that quite a lot when you use um when you're using any analog inputs on the uh, Pico, you know that that's going to be the maximum maximum value you're going to get out. No, you're in mute. Sorry. Thank you, Rasu. Um, uh, I know also, Mark, you wanted to highlight about emulators, which are a great way for people to try out, particularly uh, the Trinket emulator for the Raspberry Pi and Sense Hat, that you can really try out those hardware in advance of purchasing things um, and so that young people get a bit of experience um, with it in advance before, if you're deciding on what hardware to use. Other ones, I think uh, the, the Circuit Playground, there's the, the Microbit, there's a, there's a lot of different emulators out there that you can use to try out tools in advance before you go to the uh, putting money behind it. Um, Mark, I'll let you talk a little bit more about emulators. Cool. So um, the Sense Hat is um, a device that was designed I'm sorry if I'm speaking to the converted, you all know about this already. But the SenseHat was designed <coughs> as a device to go up on the International Space Station. That was the purpose behind it, excuse me. <coughs> um, so it has an LED matrix on it and it has a variety of sensors, temperature, humidity, pressure, a magnetometer and a gyroscope. Um, uh, sensors are all on it that you can interact with again using Python. So it's a hat that sits on top of the Raspberry Pi. Um, so they were sent up to the International Space Station in order for us to allow children to write code as part of a um, an annual challenge we do, and their code would run on the International Space Station. So originally we had two, uh, we originally we just had um, the, the single challenge, which was um, to get children to do a an experiment on the International Space Station, use the sensors in some way to do some sort of experimentation. And we've got one Astro Pi sits inside the um, ISS um, and has a camera that um, views the inside of the ISS. Another one sits um, a window with a camera that views the Earth, and that's an, um, an IR camera. So it's a camera with the infrared filter removed. Um, um, and um, so the original the original challenges were quite complicated. You've got to do this big scientific experiment, and then we wanted to open it up for younger children. So we created something called uh, Mission Zero, which is a much more simple um, um, challenge for younger children, where um, they can write code, and their code will be run on the ISS, and they do receive a certificate to say that their code has run in space, so they can they can brag that um, they've written code that runs in space. Um, the problem with the sense hat is you need a Raspberry Pi for it, and then all the problems I talked about earlier, um, you need to be able to plug those into keyboards and monitors and mice and stuff. Um, you need to have an SD card with a, the latest operating system on it. Um, and then you need to have the sense hat, which is, a, a, um, it's not horrendously expensive. I think they were about $35, but it's still an extra expense for a coding club to have um, multiple sense hats for the children to use. So we, um, we developed two emulators. One of them runs in an online, um, uh, uh, using a browser, and that's available at trinket.io slash forward slash mission zero. So you can all open up another tab now if you want and, and go ahead to that. You can even code along with me. Um, the other one is an emulator that runs on the Raspberry Pi. And I've just thrown in the install instructions there, but you can go ahead and um, look those up on the project site. If you just, you know, just Google um, sense that emulator Raspberry Pi, you'll, you'll find the blog post that tells you how to install it. Um, so uh, Mission Zero is a competition for children um, to write code. 
they do it all in Trinket. Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate using the emulator in a second. Um, this year, the challenge is to choose the name of the flight units um, that are going up based on um, European computer scientists or scientists. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember what the name of the two Astro Pi units we have up there at the moment. It's Izzy and something else. But I forget what it's called. Um, but we've got two units up there at the moment. Two new units are going to be going up um, soon. Um, and so one of the things that we want um, the students participating in this to get the chance to vote on, on what the name of the units are going to be. Uh, they need to use the sensor to read the humidity on the International Space Station. They need to light up some LEDs and they need to keep their program under 30 seconds long. So no wild true loops, nothing running for an infinite amount of time. And then the only libraries that they're allowed to use for Mission Zero is SenseHat, Library Time and the random modules. So what I'll do is I'll just um, share my screen. And this is what you see when you go to uh, Mission Zero and Trinket. So um, Trinket Dio Mission Zero, you'll see um, this. So it's importing the SenseHat library. We're setting up um, the SenseHat object. So I'm saying Sense equals SenseHat. And one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set the rotation because um, because of the way the SenseHat sit inside the flight unit, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, the screen needs to be rotated by 270 degrees for us to be able to use it. So it's just, I don't know whether I can make this any bigger. We're still currently working with trinkets to, um, to do this rendering, but you'll see that this is the, this is what the flight units look like. So we've got a big old high quality camera on the back of that, on the bottom of it with um, a big lens that's going to be pointing out at the earth with a um, camera with the infrared filters removed. We have um, the LED matrix on the front and a couple of buttons and a joystick um, on there as well. Um, so I'm sorry this is a bit small at the moment. Um, you'll see up here I've got um, sliders so I can, because obviously it's a virtualized thing, I can vary the temperature that it's going to receive, the pressure that it reads, uh, the humidity it reads, and then by moving it around, I can alter its roll, pitch, and yaw, and that uses the magnetometer and the gyroscope to detect what rotation um, it currently has. So what I'm going to do really quickly for you is I'm going to show you like a really simple entry to Mission Zero that your learners could do. So they could literally write even less than the code I'm going to write now, to be perfectly honest with you. They could write some of this code um, adapt it, make it their own, submit it as a mission zero entry, and then they'll receive a certificate saying your code has been run in space. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clear the um, I'm going to clear the LED matrix. Okay. Um, if I set this to a, a value, so uh, let's just go um, let's go white two five five two five five. If I set this to white, I'll run it. Where's the wrong? Oh, there it is. Okay, all my LEDs turn white. If I was to set it to red, they'd all turn red. If I don't have it at all, then all my LEDs go um, dark. Okay, so I'm just going to clear um, clear it to start off with, and then I'm just going to write a message. So. So one of the um, suggested people um, the, um, for the naming of the units, so we have some suggestions, but it's completely free for everyone to do what they like, is, to, um, is Arda Lovelace. So my name um, And then I can run that. And what will happen is that text will scroll across on the LED matrix. And if I was to be running this on a real sense hat, um, you'd see that as well. And I can change the color of that text as well. So let me add in another color in here. So let's go orange equals five, and go 30, zero. And then for the text here, I can say text. It really annoys me, but at the moment you still need to use the um, 
British English version of color, which is like not normal for programming languages. Normally it would be without the U. So um, let's just say orange um, and I can change the color there. So now I'm getting um, orange text scrolling across my LED matrix. Okay, so I've already done part of the competition, yeah? So I've lit up some LEDs just by doing that part. So the other the other challenges, if you look down here, it says what the challenges are. So I've, I've passed the first one, use the LED matrix. Um, I need to read the humidity um, from the sensor. So I can do that by go, um, uh, humidity equals, and I'm going to go um, sense dot get and because we don't want to be waiting around all the time for that message to show, I'm just going to um, cancel that out for for now. Um, Humidity is not defined since dot get underscore humidity. What have I done wrong? There we go. <laughs> um, let's run that again. And so we get a value of um, humidity is currently 68 points. Okay, and I can obviously adjust my humidity up here and run it again and I'll get a different value. You might want to trim that down a bit. So I'm just going to round that value off. So I'm going to go round and I'm going to round it to one decimal place and then run that again. And now I'm getting a value of 27.2. And I could, rather than do print humidity, I could do sense.show. of um, and get it to display on the sensor. Okay, so that's a really basic, basic program, but that would be enough for learners to um, go. And you can see that it's uh, it's ticked all the boxes. So if I had a classroom code, so if I'd signed up my Coda Dojo to um, to enter mission zero, I could put my classroom code and then I could continue to the form to, to, um, to submit it. I'm just going to do something a little bit more fancy with this though. So again, I've cheated and I've got um, code already written for this. So I'm just going to put in some different colors. So I've got orange, blue, cyan, something green, yellow. Um, that I'm going to put in, I'm going to, I'll just remove that for now. I'm going to keep my humidity. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a couple of pictures. So um, to program the matrix, the LED matrix, what I can do with the sensor is I can create these lists. So I've created one list that I'm going to call wet. And I'm going to say that's a blue pixel, blue pixel, blue pixel, blue pixel, so on all the way along the top. And then the next row is as well, and then blue, orange, blue, orange, 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 blue, blue. So that's my wet um, image. And then I've got my dry image here. And then I'm just going to say that what I want my program to do is if humid is greater than or equal to 30, say, let's do sense dot set pixels wet, and then else go sense dot set dry. And then at the moment, my humidity is 27. So when I run this code, it should go and display my wet image. And then let's just whack that um, up. And now I display my, sorry, that's my wet image. And then below 30, it displays my dry image. And there we go. So that's uh, that, that's it enough. That's that would be all your um, all your learners, your kids need to do to be able to enter mission zero. And as I said, when they've um, when they've submitted, as long as it fulfills all the rules, and one of the rules is like no profanity in the code and uh, nothing dodgy in the code. So as long as all of them are checked, um, so as long as they complete all those steps, it runs for less than thirty seconds. They can submit to mission zero. 
it will run on the space station. We do send all the code up to the space station to be run on the Raspberry Pis there. And then they get a certificate saying that, you know, they're the proud owners of, of having code in space. So there we go. That's um, how you can easily access emulators um, to engage in the Astro Pi competition or just play around with the set app. Yeah, that. definitely. And I think that the that Astro Pi mission or even just playing around with the sense that it's a really good way to introduce Python to young people. So if they haven't done it before, it's kind of a nice way that it's quite visual and in Trinket, like they can run it immediately so they can see like the results happening immediately. So it's, it's kind of, it's quite a useful tool for getting them started uh, with code. And like that, if your variable name is wrong, it won't run and you'll be able to figure it out. But well done, Colin and Nadia. They pointed it out in the chat. I, I was trying to figure it out, Mark. Um, yeah, it threw me for a second. It's just an effort for me to type humidity. I do, I've got <laughs> my variable humidity. It's very, it's very reassuring, though, for people starting out that 